Do you wanna enjoy a good life when you reach your retirement? There's a place I know. Although we had our routine engagements in the past, today's gathering is a special one. Our gathering reflects our shared commitment to ensuring that you, our pensioners, maintain the deserved security and peace of mind our pensions provide. Our carefully chosen theme, our promise, your security, represents our dedication to safeguarding the trust you have placed in us. The ILO released an important report on the sustainability of the SNIT scheme, which we have used to guide improvements and to ensure the future strength of the scheme. Today, we shall have an in-depth discussion with you on that and other matters that naturally hold your interest with regard to SNIT, the SNIT scheme. We are committed to transparency, open communication, and addressing your concerns. As today's program will demonstrate, Pension schemes the world over do have their challenges, driven by various factors, to name a few, demographics, funding, the economy, politics, and so on. I could go on, the list is endless. If you look around the world, some countries have had to increase their retirement age. And indeed, we cannot say that all countries do have a final salary pension scheme like we do. And I describe ours as a final salary pension scheme because it is really based on your best three years. So it is somewhat a final salary pension scheme, a defined benefit scheme. Indeed, most countries are trying to get away from that. So we must really appreciate what we have and ensure it works for us. Despite the challenges we've had, our SNIT scheme remains strong. In fact, as of August 2024 alone, SNIT has paid well over 3.7 billion in pensions to over 250,000 retired workers in Ghana. We are focused on making the scheme even stronger by expanding coverage to the vast numbers of self-employed workers in the country. We aim to build a more inclusive system that benefits every worker, ensuring a secure retirement for all. As some of you may know, our pension system is partially funded. We are taking rigorous steps on all fronts to ensure continued sustainability of the scheme. We are managing costs better. We are improving contribution collections. We are managing investments prudently. We are engaging the government with respect to issues on arrears with some success. And we continue to improve the underlying financial performance of the scheme. Indeed, uh, for those of you who may have been looking at our financial performance, from 2021, that's, let's consider that as the uh, year after COVID, we moved into a surplus position of approximately 230 million. In 2022, in 2023, uh, we improved that and we chalked up a much more significant surplus. And in 2024, year to date, uh, we continue to produce a surplus, driven by a combination of net investment income, improved net contributions, and management of our costs. So on an underlying basis, our financial performance 
is improving. To be able to continue to do this, your support as pensioners, the beneficiaries, is invaluable. And we do not take the unflinching support and confidence you have always reposed in us for granted. It is our humble hope that you don't only leave here today reassured of the ability of SNIT to continuously pay your pensions for the many years to come, but also you leave here as ambassadors of the scheme in your communities. We at SNET continue to insist that we offer the best pension scheme that is available. And I'm pleased to be here and to share uh, this morning's breakfast and engagement with the beneficiaries or some of the beneficiaries of our pension scheme. In conclusion, and I, I intend to keep this brief, our promise your security is not just a slogan. It is our commitment to delivering reliable pensions and expanding income security to more individuals. With your trust and support, we will build a stronger, more secure future together. Once again, thank you for your unwavering commitment to SNIT and for being an integral part of our shared success. Together, we will build a stronger, more secure future for us all. Thank you very much, and thanks for your time. To my brothers and sisters, the old and the young men in the blue shirts, I say, honesty. Honesty. And honesty. Yeah, we were honest. We did hard work. That's why we went on retirement without any problem. Some couldn't. Some passed on. Some were dismissed. Good morning to all, to you all. It is an honor to stand before you today as a representative of the leadership of the National Pensioners Association of Ghana. As a retired worker and a beneficiary of the National Pension Scheme, I'm happy that the tradition of dialogue and engagement SNIT has with us pensioners continue to this day. Yes, I'm very happy here. Uh, what I know is, I remember our former Prime Minister, Dr. Busia. When South Africa wanted to attain independence, they were struggling with their the, the white men. And he said, it's only dialogue that can let you win this matter. And truly, they succeeded through dialogue. So we are very happy with the SNIT. On any time at all that we meet on this dialogue and engagement, I was happy to hear the Director General retreat the pensioners are one of the most important stakeholder groups when it comes to pensions in Ghana. It's true. Pensioners in general, as you said, about 300 and something thousand, over 300. Our membership is over 80,000, the National Pensioners Association alone. We are the only stakeholders who can independently speak from experience on the benefits and products of the SNIT scheme, which is true. We have had discussions and debates on issues of interest regarding the scheme on TV, radio, and the public space. The elders that we are, we deem it prudent to allow all parties to have their say before we impart our little wisdom and experience into the dialogue, and today we shall speak. Let me chip in here. One of our members from the Volta region, an old man, he attained 120 years 
before he passed on about a year ago, he was receiving pension, 120 years. Any time that I called him, he said, Secretary, please, tell us to this small thing, we know that if it is 50 CD cement, we shall get it all the time. I said, no problem, you will get it. But unfortunately, I was called and he said he has traveled to the unknown world. May he so rest in peace. Yes, we agree that, like any system, improvement is necessary as we strive for perfection. Yes. Yes. There's nothing on this world which is 100% pure. No. However, it is essential to recognize that, despite challenges, the state pension scheme has been and continues to be a, life, a lifeline providing income security to us retired workers. We are witnesses, pensioners. Uh, I, I engage a certain old man. Uh, if I say old man, it's an old boy, pensioner. Then we met at one of the banks and we were going for our pension. When we took the money from the, 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 the staff at the distance, then he put the money down and he wanted to leave. And I said, ah, daddy, why? Oh, but this morning, but that's what you have been taking all the time. Anyway, it is true. Do you have any problem? He said, yes. I collected the money, sent him outside, and chatted the taxi for him. Last time he met me, so I was just joking. He said, hey, <laughs> you are lucky. However, it is essential to recognize the, uh, yeah, since the scheme began paying mentally pensions in the early 90s, Pensioners have been paid every single month according to what they have. And I remember Mr. Kote, who was the senior brother to our late Lieutenant General Kote. He used to call me, he was one of the founded, founding members of the association. Say, Stephen, we have laid a good foundation. This pension scheme encourage your people to join. And one day, you see the benefit. My late Mr. Maibo also have been saying that Mr. Wachi, people will see the wisdom in the near future. They have also gone to the travel to the unknown world. May their souls rest in perfect peace. Amen. Life, as you know, has always been uncertain. Yes. We can therefore not leave our future for, to chance. No. We can't do that. Most of our young boys here are over 80, 90, but they are still kicking. Honestly, it is true. Life is abundant with uh, cautionary tales of people who made their children their pension plan. I have lived to regret it, and of individuals who had to watch in pain as their thriving businesses collapsed along with their health. I gave a talk at British Council some about four or five months ago, and we discussed this thing. If you let, if you say your children should be your, your pension this thing, you are just joking. They will also have families. How can they come and take care of you? If you call them, maybe one of the first, second, three months, they will do something. They say, oh, daddy, I'm mommy. I've also children, who I'm taking care of them. That is the problem. So it takes away all those uncertainties and pieces mentally with guaranteed yearly increments. Snit, so Director General, and your team, we say, are you cool? I took the time to research how social insurance schemes work around the world. And I came across the term contract of generations. Yes. It is a very interesting term, which, when explained, simply means one generation contributing to support the generation before it. 
and so on and so on. And it is true. Very, very true. None of us pensioners here are living on our, our contribution, the contribution that we made. We have chop all. We have chop all. It's need that is a, a happiness. But through those who are in active service, your contributions are also supporting us. And another generation will come to also support you. It will be going on going until Jesus Christ comes. This means that our pension is being partly funded by contributions of those working today, as I said. Those working today will receive their pensions partly through contributions of those who are probably still in school, as I speak, or those who are born today. The highlights, this highlights the negative consequences of any rash and emotional calls to end the scheme. In fact, when we heard this thing, when some people were saying the snake, we have to sell the snake, we have to say what? What do you mean? A certain, some of my people, I, 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 I live in Tema. They say, Secretary, go and tell those people. We bury them, their blood will go to the uh, uh, grave. Before they themselves, they'll go. They shouldn't make any attempt, never, on this earth. Because we know what we are getting. If we know we have 50 cities every month, we get it. We like that. But we entreat SNE to uh, do something. <laughs> the very workers of today are the ones who stand to lose the most when that chain or contract is broken. I've been saying this. You lose. I'm telling you. Whenever you meet and the uh, discussion, especially, excuse me, with the media, when you get any information, my policy is, what is the proof? If you give me the proof, I'll follow you. If I don't have the proof, I'll never. Not that anything at all when you hear, then you go and make it. I remember we were, we, were, we were distributing our vehicles. Somebody sent information to some of the media, and they, they published something. I told them to retract. And they retracted. Go through, investigate, and see. If you give a dog a bad name to sacrifice it, one day you realize that you did wrong. So we are telling you that you, the very workers of today, are the ones who stand to lose the most when that chain of contract is broken. There will be no one to pay for this. Yours, no, no one. I therefore humbly urge all other stakeholders to welcome engagements with SNIT and get better informed on the scheme so that we all can approach issues of our pensions dispassionately and with seriousness. When we come together for discussions, that's how we do it. If there's any problem, we just jump in and we, 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 we throw the, uh, the baby with the dirty water. No. We must go through engage some engagements and this thing, and we shall find the correct uh, this thing. We, con we, the pensioners, will continue sharing our pos positive stories with everyone, including those who may doubt the value of the scheme. We will remind the younger generation that what they contribute today is an investment for their future. A future where they can retire with dignity. A future where unexpected illness does not leave them destitute. And a future where their families will be supported when they are no longer here to provide. It's up to you, the younger ones. The SNIN scheme is more than just numbers on paper. It's a promise to the hardworking people of this country that when the time comes, they will not be forgotten. And indeed, we, the pensioners of today, have not been forgotten. Let us protect this scheme so that future generations can look back and say, yes, this was something worth preserving. Before I, 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 I take my seat, 
director and your team. The year is getting to an end. And you know. And you know. And you know. We are expecting. We are expecting. Thank you. And may we all continue working towards strengthening our pension scheme for our sticks and that of our children. I went for my pension, and my, 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 my granddaughter, a small girl about three years from uh, Canada, who came to visit us. When I sent her to the bank and I collected the money, she said, Daddy, uh, Grandpa, why did you collect the money for us? Oh, it's my pension. Pension? What is pension? I explained, they are very clever, inquisitive. As soon as you went home, I called, Mommy, Daddy has gone to, uh, Grandpa has collected some money from a bank. Ah, he said, what money? It's for him. He said, no. I said, say pension. What is pension? Then we started explaining, he said, you, you grow. When we go, you go and work. A time will come, when you get to a certain age, you also collect it. Ah, but I'm three years. When? I say, your time will come. So I thank all of you, Director, as I said, and your team. I know, I know, and we all know, and we say, God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. SNP is also the largest institutional investor in the information, communication, and technology industry, with over 300 million worth of investments in the sector. SNED has investment in eight out of the 23 commercial banks. SNED has improved health facilities and accessibility to quality health care by the construction of major hospitals and satellite clinics. So the last three valuations were conducted by IRO. What we should understand is that, like I said, it's a technical report. They are supposed to provide an insight to how the scheme is faring going forward. Let me divert a little, digress a little bit. Our scheme, the Director General mentioned it, it's a defined benefit scheme. Um, what it means is that it's also partially funded. What it means is that when we say a defined benefit scheme, it means you have, you can make contributions today, or you ask your all members of the scheme, most of us are, you can determine the benefits you get before you even go on retirement. So your benefit is based on the formula. It's defined. Once you join, there are rules, and the benefits computation is also de determined. So the scheme bears the risk of the investment and everything that you, if you were to place your monies in ordinary investments, you are going to bear. So all you do is that you rest, pay your contributions, and relax. But when there is time for you to go on retirement, you just assess the scheme. That's what it does, a defined benefit scheme. So uh, you don't suffer any fees in your investment, or you don't suffer any um, low returns on investment, or any crash in the environment, economic environment. You don't care about it. The scheme will bear all that risk. We say it's partially funded. What does it mean? It means that by the design of the scheme, you don't have individual accounts. Like you have, you have opened an account with a bank, you contribute into it, you know amount that you contribute, and if there's any investment and there's a return, you publish it, and you know that this is my money. So when I go on retirement, I take my money. That's not how this scheme works. Mr. Wachi mentioned it. He said it's something we call a contract of generations. Contract of generations, hear me. I don't, I'm not comfortable using that term. I've said it before. Because the contract of generation is that those yet unborn have signed a contract with us, those living, that when we go on retirement, they are going to um, bring in money to support our retirement. That's what it means, basically. But you all know that those who are not born are not alive to sign contracts. That is why I'm not comfortable. But that is, in principle, that's what it means. It means that. We need people to contribute to support those who are on pension. Basically, that's what it is. This is how the scheme has been designed. That's what makes this scheme so special. It stands out and it stands out across the world because of the design of the scheme. So 
in, in summary, what it means is that so long as people are born, I can even go back to so long as people do stuff in their bedrooms, it's all impact on the scheme. Because that will result in the, the best of people. So when they are born, and they will grow to, they will go to school, of course, or they will get into some employment, and they become members of the scheme, and they contribute into the scheme, the scheme should be allowed to pay benefits for all those who retire. Basic principle. That's what it is. That's how the scheme has been designed. As long as people are born into the system, economic system, and they become workers, and they become members of the scheme and contribute into the scheme, the scheme itself should be able to thrive and pay for those who go on retirement. It tells you that the monies or the contribution you bring in is not enough to pay you till you die. It's not. It has never been enough. So contrary to what you hear about the SNIS scheme, that, oh, that's a fallacy. There is absolutely no truth in that. Because the contributions that you bring in, if you contribute for 15 years, or for 35 years, or for 40 years, it will not be enough to take care of you. That's the pension that we pay you till you die. Mr. So Wachi mentioned that somebody is, um, died at the age of 120 years, and the person was still a, a, a member of the scheme, or a pensioner. Well, we can interrogate. I was just saying that maybe the person reduced his age a little bit uh, when he joined the scheme, or when he became eligible. Uh -huh. But if you interrogate the age, you may have some questions, but that's not what we are going to discuss. The point is that we have people who are old, some are over 100 years, and they are on the scheme. And they started enjoying the scheme and the benefits long ago. It means that they have long exhausted the contributions they brought into the scheme as members of the scheme. Long ago. But the scheme says it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you are 90 or 80 or you spend 60 years as, as pensioner, it doesn't matter, we'll pay you till you die. Nobody can suppress that. That is based on the contract of generation principle that we have in the scheme. So that is an assurance I want to give you. The scheme will continue to thrive, basically by design, so long as people join in and contribute. That is why, if I may quickly add, that recently you hear that we are asked extending coverage to everybody, including the self-employed, what we call the seed. It is to bring in more people to the scheme so that it can help support and pay for the benefits of those who are on retirement. And so that when they also go on retirement, there will be new people to bring in new money to pay for them. So that alone should tell you the scheme will survive without any new monies, I mean new uh, returns on investment. But that is not enough. Apart from that, there are measures management has put in place and we continue to do to make sure that even though the scheme has been designed that when we get new people coming in, it's able to take care of the people, we still have more funds to make sure that we are comfortable, that it can persist for generations. And that's why we are looking at our investment. So we collect the contributions, we use them to pay the benefits, excess contributions are now invested to bring you more returns so that we can pay you more. Pay you more, not pay you aside the formula, no. But for what Mr. Uh, Boachi was talking about, the year is coming to an end, and we need to adjust the pensions, which I'm sure you are very interested in. Right. Yes, and we are in the process of doing it. In fact, I was just discussing with the DG a while ago that we are going to finalize it, and I can assure you you'll be smiling. Wow. So, because we want you to smile, if I say you'll be smiling, even if we give you 2%, you'll be smiling. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Just like we gave you 25% two years ago when you were smiling. Uh -huh. It should be more than what you are receiving, basically. Because we want to pay you so that you'll be smiling, that is why we are undertaking prudent investment measures, policies, to make sure that we have a lot of uh, positive returns coming into the scheme. I want you the fund so that we'll be able to pay you what we are supposed to pay you according to the time that we're living. So going on, I said that 
the law enjoins us to um, get this report every three years. The main reason why we are getting this report is that it should advise management that based on the data we have, and maybe based on how the economy is behaving. I mentioned that it's based on three things. The data, the data has to be um, reliable, that the data you're going to use has to be reliable. It has to be sufficient and reliable. And then the methodology you're going to use, that I'm talking about the external actuary. The methodology should be also appropriate for the scheme, and it should be consistent with the accepted, actually accepted uh, practices across the country, across the world. And then the formula, if you like, the projections that you are going to make. So the assumptions, the methodology, and then the data. Those assumptions are not fixed. If I'm an actuary and I'm performing this job, I can safely say that, oh, I, I envisage that in the next five years, the inflation rate is going to go down to a single digit based on certain trends or based on some observations. And I will place that in the, in the assumption. Another actuary can say that the inflation will be 15% going forward and it will uh, 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 decrease all the way up to 10%. So it depends on the external actuary who is doing that, who is undertaking that exercise. Somebody can also assume that Oh, we are going to have high inflation because of economic, um, the political situation that we envisage in the next 10 years is going to be like that and that. All those things determine the outcome of the evaluation. That is the point I'm trying to make. So it is not cast in soul. If I engage one actuary to perform this exercise, his results may be different from another actuary who is also competent but based on these assumptions. They will be based on the same data and also the methodology that they will use. So that is how the actual evaluation exercise is done. So it is to give management, if you like, a telescopic view of how the scheme is. So it's like you are sailing, you're on a, on a high seas, and then the captain will just use the binoculars, um, not the binoculars, the telescope and see ahead that there is an iceberg several thousands of nautical miles away. And they are heading towards the iceberg. I'm sure all of you know, or will agree with me, that if I seen an iceberg ahead several thousands of nautical miles away, would I still sail towards the iceberg and hit? Nobody would do that. You definitely direct it. So that is exactly what the scheme, that the, the report does. That your evaluation does. It gives you that idea, they say, oh, so going ahead, based on the contributions we are receiving and the payments we are making, it's likely that if we don't do anything about it, and I'm going to go into what we should do about it, you are going to hit this iceberg. Then quickly, management will take steps and say that we then let's veer off of the path that we are on and make sure we don't hit the iceberg. That's exactly how the evaluation report is supposed to do. So it will tell management, and the management will take decisions and move away from that path so that we don't hit the iceberg and we still continue to sail and get to the final destination. So there is nothing to be worried about. These reports have been produced, as I said, over the years. The same ILO that did the last three reports 2014, 2017, 2020, they are the same people who produce, and in all the reports, there is a caution. So you see the recommendations in the report, they say do A, B, C, D, based on the data, it is so, so, and so, we cannot say, we can confirm that the scheme is not sustainable. They will say something like that. In the next 75 years, please, they will look at ahead, so in the next 75 years, this is what the projection is about. We are doing projection based on 75 year period. Sometimes 100, now we reduce it to 75. That in the next 75 years, based on the assumptions we are making towards the economy, towards demography, how people are going to be born into the scheme, how people are going to immigrate, based on all those assumptions that are not cast in stone, we see that the scheme might not be sustainable based on the contributions coming in. I mean, those who are yet on board to contribute, 
and those who are going to go on pension, those who are going to die. All those assumptions have to be made before you can come out with any pronouncement or any suggestions at all or recommendations about the scheme. So it means that all those ones are not certain. They are not certainty. And in fact, in the report, as a professional, you need to state that. That people don't quote you and use the projections as if they are predictions that are supposed to come in. They are not. The actuaries themselves will write and tell you that you don't have to use this one. They are not predictions. They are to give you an insight. And even the assumptions may have to be reviewed every year. It is stated in the report that the assumptions that they use to arrive at those recommendations, they may have to review them because you are going to have real data, not projections into the future. So the point is that they are all based on assumptions and based on the data and based on economic situation, based on demography and migration and all that go into the actual evaluation report. That is what I said, why I said from the beginning, that it's a technical report. You don't just read it as it is and then take it and go to town with it. That's exactly the point I was making. Okay, so if you look at some of the reports, you see that in 20, 2011, this evaluation report was uh, undertaken by the government actuaries department in the UK. And when they did a report, they said that by 2019, five years ago, if nothing happens, nothing changes, they did a report in 2011, and they said eight years after that, if we don't do anything at all about contributions and the same contributions that we are collecting and paying benefits along the same trend, then by 2019, we will not have enough contributions to pay the benefits that we are paying. That is, the benefits payment will exceed the contribution that we are getting in. And in fact, that scheme, they did a projection for 70 years, the next 70 years from 2011. And they said that the fund was going to be depleted by 2031. This is 2011 that they made that projection. Then we engaged a different actuary in 2014, three years later, and 2017 and 2020, the same ILO. And they also said that in 2035, the total income, that is contribution, investment income, and other income will no longer be sufficient to pay all the annual expenditures, including the benefits. Mind you, in 2011, they said 2031. But in 2014, three years after the evaluation, they now said 2035. What does it tell you? It tells you, or it should tell you, that after the 2011 valuation, we don't just go to sleep. There are some things that we did to make sure that we don't hit the iceberg, but we veer off the path. And so now when they did the valuation three years later, now instead of 2031, they are talking about 2035. Uh, 2019, sorry, they are talking about 2035. So that is how the valuation report is interpreted. So if you look at it, it said the result will start decreasing, and by year 2042, it drops to zero. But the first one was 2031 that was going to drop to zero. I hope you are getting the picture now. Yeah. So that is how the report is. So fast forward three years later, 2017, they said starting 2032, the total income will no longer be sufficient. Just as they said 2019. Now they say 2032. And then uh, by 38, 2038, uh, the reserves will drop to zero. So it has moved from 42 to 38. Did we go to sleep? No. We still put some measures in place to make sure that the scheme became sustainable. And then when we came to 2020 reports, where it became topical, they said 2036, the scheme was going to collapse. The same. So you realize that in every valuation report, there is some kind of a discussion or a, a talk on the sustainability of the scheme, given when the scheme or the reserves were going to be exhausted. It doesn't mean that it's going to be exhausted. No. Far from it. Let's go ahead. Slide. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to assure you that the scheme is going nowhere. It's going to be alive. As long as people are born, 
as long as we do prudent management of the scheme, it will be around to take care of you till you are 120 years, or 110, or 109. As we have some people on the scheme right now who are over 100 years and still enjoying pension. That's exactly what it's going to be like. In the 2020 evaluation report, ILO made some recommendations. And in fact, let me quickly mention that what drives through, what cuts across all the reports is the recommendation that we should adjust contributions. Quickly, give me a minute and let me mention something to you. You see, our scheme financing, the system of financing that we use for our scheme, we call that scaled premium system of financing. What does it mean? It means that we determine, or the actuaries will determine a contribution rate for a long period of, say, 70 years, or let's say 50 years, and to say that, oh, from now to the next 50 years, if we have every employer paying contribution, on, or every employee, or every member of the scheme, contributing 20% of his basic salary for the next 20 years, in the next 50 years, we will be able to pay pension, so so and so, so and pension to the member when he retires. So, the period. When we do that calculation, what it does is that it will bring in more funds to be able to pay those who are going on pension, and there will be some money left to invest for reserve. So, you invest that money, the money is supposed to go on reserve. For the reserve money, we invest it, and then to bring returns. So, within the 50 year period, we are safe. Because the calculation has been done, this is scientific. Okay, so that contribution is the contribution that has been determined for the period. That is our scheme. So, as soon as you end the period, you go back to the calculation, the drawing board, and do your calculation again and see whether the same contribution you determine for that 70 period or 50 period is still valid to go ahead for the next 70 years. So we call that period of equilibrium. So it stays there, and then you do the calculation again and you determine the contribution rates. That is the scale premium of finance. That's how it works. But I must admit that since the scheme came into being from 1991 till date, we have never reviewed the contribution rates. It is only the new scheme, the 766 that introduced half, uh, half percentage point increase in the contribution on the, on, the, on the side of the employer and then an employee to make it 18.5%. It used to be 17.5%. And out of the 18.5%, you all know that 5% goes to your second tier. It's not Senate so money. And then two and a half goes to NHIS on, on behalf of the members. It's not Senate so money. So ours is 11%. So the new scheme came to determine the contribution rate at 11% for Senate, whilst maintaining all the benefits that we're paying under the old scheme. That's what it does. That's another discussion that we'll go into, because that didn't help the scheme that much. So the point I'm making is that it is time for us to relook the contribution that we are collecting, which is the 11% we are having now. And if I, if I have to be even generous, let's say there's 17, the 18.5%, 5% that doesn't come to us, so the 13.5%. This is the time to review it. And what is common in all the reports that have been produced over the years, I'm talking about the actual evaluation report, is the need for us to change the contribution rates. And managers are, are taking steps to do that, to initiate that discussion with all our stakeholders, and then decide with the actuaries, come out with a figure that will be necessary to make sure that we are comfortable to pay you to your attain the age of 120 years. And that's what we are going to do. It that cuts across all the reports. They also suggested that we should have a funding policy that will guide us in our funding um, how we're going to fund the scheme and how you're going to pay monies and all that, which we have done. And it's going through the process and to be finalized. Next. There's something else that the ILO mentioned. That one doesn't really go to help the scheme per se, but help the members, which is that there's a need to consolidate salaries. We all know that when we are working, in fact, yesterday I spoke with a guy a doctor, a medical doctor. And he 
is going on retirement. In fact, he was my mate. I didn't know he was older than me when we were in school. But he's retiring this, this month, uh, July. And he said he was trying to find out how much he was going to get. So I did some estimate for him. And it wasn't, it wasn't much. I'm like, ah, so how, how much were you paying? His take home was close to 10,000. But his pension was about 3,000. 3,000, 3,500. So I was wondering. Not knowing he was collecting a lot of allowances. The take home was made up of a lot of allowances. Night allowance, belt allowance, laser allowance, hair allowance, every allowance you can think of. <laughs> every allowance put together. At the end of the month, he takes over and he's happy. The basic salary, the law was talking about, the law is talking about basic salary. The basic salary of this guy was like 5,000 or thereabout, half of the take home that he was getting which is so, so unfair to him and to many people like him. Because it's like they are not looking at the future. Now, they are not looking at the future. Now, enjoying life, getting everything now. He's okay with all the allowances being paid to him. Which is sad. Because once you retire, first you lose all the allowances. You're no longer working for an employer. He's not going to pay you any allowances. So that one goes up. You are stripped. Then you come back to the basic. And it's not like he's going to pay you the basic as your pension. No, we have a formula. Define benefits, I told you. So that formula will be used to calculate it. If you are lucky and you contributed for at least 35 years, you get a full 60% of that basic. So if you're getting 5000 a month as your basic, you sell your pension with, like, say, 3,000. That's not being generous. That's the person has worked for 35 years or more. And then somebody was getting 10,000 as take home. All of a sudden, 3,000 take home. That will probably send him to his early grave. Because he has gotten used to the 10,000 lifestyle. So he should have been made whole or partly, you know, close to that. But the reality is that you will not get anywhere close. That is why we are starting the conversation about consolidating salaries and allowances. So that whatever you are earning, because it's like a social, it's a nice social issue. Your allowances and other things have become your income, a part of your income. So if you are insuring your income, that should be insured as well. Uh -huh. So we are going to do that tactfully so that the scheme doesn't suffer. I say, I say so because we can have people trying to abuse that. And then they'll take, they go and hide under merging or consolidating salaries and allowances and be inflating their salaries so that they can get better pension. That one will not allow that. In fact, we did, my office did some job and said that we need about those who are about 20 years or minimum 15 years to contribute to the scheme, they can start adding up all the allowances and the salaries. So that by the time they retire, you have fat salaries, which will translate into fat pension. OK, next. So like I said, when you see the iceberg, you don't go straight into it. You try to divert the course so that it don't hit. Before we even talk about increasing contribution rates to increase more contributions and more money to make sure that we pay you to your 120 years, there are a raft of measures that we put in place and we continue to engage um, so that the scheme becomes more sustainable. Before we even uh, uh, go into the suggestions or recommendations from the reports, various reports. And some of them, are, as you know, I'm sure by now everybody knows that we are what we call ghost pensioners, ghost workers, ghost whatever. Senators also have some ghost pensioners, in quotes. But we are able, we are quick to remove all the ghost pensioners. The one in charge is sitting there, the general manager benefits. He will not spare you. As soon as, and this, in this case, let me mention that we need, the, we need to uh, work with you, the National Pensions Association, that as soon as somebody passes, you let us know so that we terminate the pension and add it to your pension. <laughs> if you don't tell us and we don't get we don't we don't terminate it, we don't add it to your money. 
Uh -huh. So he tell us immediately and we deactivate. And so every year we try to do that to make sure that those who are paying on the payroll are the people legitimately uh, qualified for that benefit. Pensions are not meant for ghosts. They are meant for li the living. So under no circumstance should somebody die and then the relative or the children or some grandchildren will take the, the ATM, go to the ATM card, go to the ATM and redraw the money. That is, that is stealing. And very soon people will be prosecuted for that. In fact, we are going to put in measures to make sure that if you do that, it's stealing actually. Uh -huh. But just that we haven't taken steps to prosecute people. We want to make sure that we, we, we correct or we safeguard the funds for now. But later we go into prosecution where, it, where then it will deter people from doing it going forward. So that is one of the major things that we've been doing to make sure that we make, uh, the scheme becomes sustainable. By doing so, as of March last year, we have saved over five, almost 520 million cities. What we do is, we, you are supposed to renew as a pensioner to make us know that you are alive, that we are, you are so strong. Uh -huh. So if you don't show up to renew, then we deactivate. But if you show up, we pay you all the arrears if there is there's any arrears to be paid. So we don't want to cheat you, we don't want to cheat anybody. So that's what we do. And then we have embarked in other operational exercises to make sure that employers pay what they are supposed to pay for their employees. We have this mass registration, mass inspection, mass prosecution, all those things are to make sure that we bring in more money because employers are supposed to do their job. And human beings, if you leave them, especially those who don't know the value that it has for their members or their, their staff, they may not even comply. So we make sure that they comply and we take the necessary steps to ensure that happens. Um, DG mentioned it, and we saw, I don't have to repeat, we have engaged the government intensive, intensely to make sure that every money owed them are paid. And the government, I must say, has done well over the years and are paid almost up to date with the current contributions and even the arrears. They made plans, I'm sure you heard about it in late April, amount of about 2.5 billion uh, CDs was paid to SNET in terms of bonds and, and other uh, securities um, um, to make sure that our, our, our books look good. SNIT. SNIT. We deliver on our promise.